There's a group of people on this planet who have hidden the truth from you for a very long time. They have a vision for your future that they know doesn't work unless they keep you in the dark about some things. Like the true nature of our spirituality. The truth about how our reality works. How each of us has the ability to choose and change it. Individually, but especially when united. The truth about civilizations that rose and fell before our own. The truth that we are not alone on this planet and have never been. I'm Tim Bravo. Over years of searching, studying, synchronicities, and experience, I've discovered that the big picture of our reality is very different from the one that's been spoon-fed and programmed into us through school, religion, and mainstream media. We've been lulled into a hypnotic sleep, a nightmare really, conned into co-creating a world that doesn't come close to reflecting our true nature. I'm here to help others wake up so we can work together as sisters and brothers to create a new vision for our future and a world that works for all of us. This is Bravo New World. Good day, sisters and brothers of planet Earth. I'm Tim Bravo. Thanks for opening your hearts and minds today. I first learned of Amardeep Kaleka and his production company Never Ending Light when the first trailer for the upcoming film Sirius hit the internet. Like many of you, I've followed Dr. Stephen Greer's work with the Disclosure Project for years. The trailer, and everyone released since then, provides a very encouraging look at a film that could blow the doors open on UFO disclosure once and for all. I immediately followed Kaleka on Vimeo and signed up for serious updates. There was a lot of buzz about the movie due to its tremendous Kickstarter campaign. Amardeep Kaleka was a filmmaker poised to make crowdfunding history. Then, August 5th, 2012 came. News spread like wildfire that another mass shooting event had gone down in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. We were told a white supremacist PSYOPs Army veteran shot and killed six members of a Sikh congregation. And that's when the world outside the UFO disclosure community met Amardeep Kaleka. Because one of the victims, the founder of the temple, just happened to be Amardeep's dear father, Satwan Singh Kaleka. In a way, Amardeep became the face of this tragedy, granting interview after interview across major media. Now, with work on Sirius nearing completion, Never Ending Light has announced its next project, a film called Nursery Crimes, a documentary about violence in America and how we can come together to stop it. I've asked Amardeep to be my first guest and kick off these Bravo New World podcasts right. In the following interview, I hope you'll be able to listen past some internet audio issues to hear what Arm has to say. We're going to get an update on Sirius, hear some of the out-of-this-world experiences that have come his way as director of the film, and how the film's most recent trailer was received at the Sundance Film Festival. We'll get his take on what happened the day his father's temple was attacked. Take a look at Nursery Crimes and hopefully learn a bit about the person, the soul, that is our brother, Amardeep Kaleka. Amardeep, thanks a million for coming on and sharing with us. Absolutely. Now, how has your understanding of the UFO topic changed since working with Dr. Greer on this film? I mean, we've gotten, came into the subject from the Ancient Aliens franchise, because we obviously uh, started following them. It's funny because randomly I go to the Apple store here in LA and somebody knows me from Sirius now and they'll ask me the same question. I say, what do you think about engineering theory? And it, it is uh, an interesting aspect. Um, that's where my fascination with it started. And then it kind of branched off and as we start to see the disclosure tapes, we started to think about is there information that secret societies have that they're holding back on by using it for their own personal gains? What's going on? So I think personally, the extraterrestrial questions and thoughts and uh, the ideas, uh, they've matured now more than ever to be as close to reality as I could get them in terms of like having a year worth of research and talking to an amazing amount of people in interviews and, and getting down to the crux of it. Awesome. Now, I got to ask you, though, have you ever had a UFO sighting of your own? Interestingly enough, I've never had a UFO sighting before uh, Sirius. Have you since? I have. I have. As a matter of fact, it was on a, a C5 exhibition. 
Ah. And I wanted to reiterate, it was amazing. I mean, it's in the film. It's one of the first things you see in the film. Uh, we were in Colorado and Crestone, and it happened to me multiple times over that session. Something would talk to me, and I was meditating, and I'd look up over my right shoulder where the whisper was coming, and I'd look up, and there was this thing floating to the sky. And it, it, it would be floating very slow in terms of like the way it is uh, moving and progressing through the sky. I, that it would seem unnatural, like it was going to fall out of space, you know? And, I mean, it definitely, I was riveted by it. There was an emotional connection with, you know, the UFO. So you actually had a telepathic communication, not just a sighting. That's pretty awesome. That was pretty awesome, and um, it was definitely uh, me and the other camp person were sitting across from each other, and we had some sort of, like, voice talking to us. And you know the difference between you talking to yourself and something external. Yeah. Because it's like it's almost like a call and response. You ask a question, it answers, and it asks you a question, and you answer. Them. And when you're answering, the next part of the you know the answer from that side is coming. So it's a true back and forth. And what people in the in the field call going to channel one. So you know maybe beings from all over the universe can be in that specific channel at the same time as the chat room. <laughs> Interesting. And that's almost, to me, more just just more astounding uh, an experience than having a sighting. I mean, that is, that's contact. Well, that's that's what we're trying to get across to the film. Because it's serious. It's not so much we have to search for physical truth and the evidence behind it. And we want to reiterate that most of the evidence that we can find points to the fact that people need to continue searching and need to figure out what's going on because it's obviously something unknown to all of us. I have to ask, were you there for the filming of the EBE in Spain? You know, sadly, we were not allowed to go because of the contact with the people who own the EBE or between we and those people, we were heartbroken. But also, yeah. as, as a filmmaker, the whole point, I've always said this to Steve and all the people, and Steve has obviously been doing this for 20 years. He really lacks an objective viewpoint to see the situation from. And as a documentary filmmaker, that's all I can offer. Mm-hmm. I have no true agenda or need to push that agenda. I have no financial obligations. I have no reason other than finding out whether or not this is true. And that's just a personal thing. And if I was there, I, I think or if our team was there, obviously, I think we would have covered it tremendously better than the way it was covered. But also, we could we could be a lot more effective just the way the politics are going to sometimes. But Dr. Greer was able to be there. I th- I'm pretty sure I saw him in the footage, right? He, he was. Yeah, Dr. Greer was there. Uh, Jan Bravo was there. Uh, and Jan Bravo was uh, an excellent, you know, doctor. Yeah. Now, we are still waiting on the results from the tissue samples, right? We are. We are. And hopefully within two weeks we'll get them. I can't give a firm deadline because it's just the way everything is always been playing out. But hopefully within three weeks we'll have some results. We'll be able to shoot and interview and do everything we need to do. So other than getting those results in and, and finishing up the shooting that's related to that, is, is there anything else that we're waiting on as far as Sirius goes? Uh, I'm waiting on a ton of stuff in terms of licensing and lead work because, um, as you know, we're trying to pull the clothes off the emperor, but that means that we're opening ourselves up to uh, a ton of powers that we do, you know, obviously, legal action. So we just have to dot our hat and cross our T's as well as we can and get over to the legal department that we work with as a production company to make sure that nobody comes back and says, hey, you know, you're using that and it will, you're using that, it's slanderous. And the closer you stick to the truth, the more the law is on your side. Well, talking about possibly opening yourself up to some sorts of reaction or attacks from the powers that be, that kind of leads right into my next question, which is, have you received threats for working on this film? I haven't personally received threats. I will say, randomly, a serious website keeps always getting knocked down. It gets knocked down probably once every three days. And we've done more hours of work than just keeping that one website up. We have in terms of all of our all of our other websites because it seems like something keeps knocking it out or changing you know the stuff we have on it, placing the code. That's kind of a, an annoying thing, but it happens quite often. Hmm. Well, it is interesting because I've noticed in the past that, and like tonight, my audio has been working just fine, and tonight we're dealing with some stuttering audio issues, and uh, it, it just, I don't know, seems a little strange to me. And for you guys to have to constantly deal with the headaches of trying to keep that most important site online, I don't know, I think you uh, you raise a good point. 
Thank you. Yeah, it, it seems suspect. You can't say that it's definitely somebody messing with you, but you know, it certainly looks like that's a strong possibility. No, totally. And so, you know, after we did a lot of uh, a lot of these interviews, um, we we talk about it in the film like uh, obvious threats, like let's say what happened to Stan McMire. Yeah. Um, but there's a t- there's a ton of subtext and sub- Conscious threats that happen all the time, or based on ridicule, or based on these little these little things, which are just technological glitches, you can't point anything to. However, I do have to I do have to warn because once your conspiracy radar starts going off, <laughs> you'll start forming connections to things that are not connected, and you're drawing connections based on a, a lot of different gray areas where people would misspeak or have a problem. And, the best example I can give is the day that August 5th happened, I was, you know, like trying to get to my dad, trying to get to my mom, trying to get to people that were inside the temple. And while I was there, like people would keep pulling me away for an interview and they would start to notice that I was on the phone with people inside the temple. So they would start listening in. And uh, a good example of that is somebody pulled me over for an interview and my idea was get out as much information as possible because I'm, I'm the same type of person where I think transparency is the best policy yes. all, all the time yes it is the it is the number one so like when somebody would ask, ask me you know what have you heard i would say this is what i've heard you know i've heard there's multiple people i've heard such and such and that's coming from you know i've heard it multiple people from inside the temple like my mom sitting in the crowd and is hearing multiple footsteps you know and she's in multiple footsteps because she's in such a frightening situation. She's drawing a conclusion that those footsteps are obviously not just one person. Well, and I got to ask you about that because there was a member of your dad's congregation who was on camera. And I wish I remembered the guy's name, but he said that there were four white male shooters. And the official story is there's just the one U.S. Army veteran who was a white supremacist. I mean, it's, it, it's definitely, I've never seen that interview. I've definitely sent it to me because I think what happened was in the midst of the chaos. And this is just the way small communities are. Like, they're getting information, piecemealing it from text messages. Even the 911 operators are highly confused in the fact that we speak multiple languages. And even when somebody's speaking broken English, like my dad was saying, like there's there's somebody's opening fire, somebody firing in the temple, and for us, like our English translation to gunfire is firing, right? The nine one one operator listened, and the language barrier presented a number of problems for everybody. Now that specific person, I, I definitely would love to see the video, but I gotta believe they were speaking from a place where they thought they had information, just like I did, and they were trying to get it out to as many people as possible, so the case of transparency. However, after, I mean, I walked that crime scene, immediately on Friday morning when they opened it, and there was still blood on the walls and on the carpet, luckily, I, you know, we got in and were able to, like, help clean up. We had, like, a small detail of people that were, were coming to clean up so we could start the temple again. And, I mean, you don't see multiple footsteps. You don't see multiple tracks. I'm, I have a, a degree in criminology. I can do a crime scene investigation better than most police officers. And I, I, can go, I went through each area where there was a murder, and I could see the... If I did my crime scene investigation, how many shells were on the ground, where they were, where the bullets that went through the body lodged, where the bullets that missed lodged, at what height the, the shooter was at, the angle, you know, it, it was so I was physically in the vicinity. There are no other bloody footsteps running all over the place. There's just the one guy, you know, and you can tell all of them missed shots at, at the same level in terms of the, the height. Okay. Um, there's just, I mean, a ton of evidence. So you believe the attack happened as it was related to the public through the media. You don't believe that there it, there were multiple shooters, that it may have been a black op designed you know, for some other reason or reasons. Absolutely. I do not think it was multiple shooters on scene. It's definitely tricky when uh, we're discussing like black ops and psych ops and psy ops and you know, whether or not 
certain senior society members have an ability to, I don't know, let's say control psychotronic weapons that, you know, gravitate around Earth's radius and are able to like set off asymmetrical people. You know, I, I can't speak to that because I have no facts on that information. I can't say no or yes, but I will say that in the case of August 5th, it was one person. He was a white extremist. He was a former skinhead. He hated all people. He was Jewish and there was a synagogue in the area that his girlfriend had like, you know, been in contact with. He would have attacked that. If it was Moss, he would have attacked that. He just know that he hated other people. And I was like, well, that's far too simple of a, a answer because why would you, I mean, you hate other people to go through some years without killing somebody and you're, you know, a former military guy and then you're set off in some way that, so we're, we're still trying to figure out, did you have a thing with somebody that was Punjabi? Did his, you know, girl have a run happen? But those are, I mean, it's far easier to believe that something like that happened. Like, you know, he just met somebody, they had a children and you know, they had a discussion that was not obviously favorable, and he came back and just went psycho. It's easier to think that that's true rather than it was a government conspiracy to stop me from continuing shooting serious. I think, the gov- like, anybody in a place of power would know that that happening on August 5th was giving me a bigger microphone to actually talk from. I don't think it's connected to the film project. I know Steve and either like we we've, we've communicated to about it so many times, and we've had to have that discussion because obviously there was a time where I thought about not continuing the production. That was one of the first things that jumped into my mind is, hey, this might possibly be something like that, like where it's the government a conspiracy. And after going through the you know the information and being there, and that's what I encourage everybody, every serious supporter, to do is. If you really want to know about extraterrestrials, I mean, go on a C5 with somebody. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I have to say, it, if it were a black op that was designed to shy you away from continuing work on Sirius, then it would make sense to me that they would make sure that you knew about it before it happened. I, I guess my hypothesis I was working on was that, you know, they were thinking, well, if we can't convince you, you know, if you're not afraid of, of yourself getting hurt, then what about your family? And with all these shootings that we've had in the last year, there seems to have been somebody of significance in the immediate family. So that just kind of fit in a pattern to me. But if you say that you weren't contacted before and or after the shooting, then I have to say, yeah, it sounds to me like, you know, you're on the right track, brother, that, you know, this was just a really bad thing. No, it, it totally was that in, in a fact. Nobody ever contacted me before to raise the threat, and nobody contacted me after. And that's the biggest thing. Is nobody, nobody's going to spend that much time and energy to organize such a blatant, you know, screw up like like Newtown, and not be able to think out all the details in terms of okay, we're going to stop this. We uh, threaten this guy before, and if he says no, we're going to maybe do a slight thing to like like we're going to smash his tires or throw a brick through his window. I mean, that costs no money, right? That costs me fifty bucks to hire somebody to do that. Rather than go through this extravagant, you know, conundrum of a conundrum and then hope that this guy gets the message. I mean, that's just, that's human psychology. And I, these guys are working on that level in terms of, you know, think tanks. And I have a ton of friends who work on think tanks. Mm-hmm. They, they wouldn't lapse on that sort of thing. That's like a normal thing. It's like, hey, see if this guy will back down to like a basic phone call. I mean, that costs no money. Rather than going all the way to the extreme. So there's, there's a ton of factors there. Well, I know that you've got a busy schedule, but before we go, I do want to talk about your new project, and that is Nursery Crimes. Can you kind of give us a bit about Nursery Crimes? Absolutely. Um, Nursery Crimes is a project that's near and dear to my heart. It's about violent America and craziness that's been going on for the last probably two decades, but especially over the last, uh, you know, half a year or nine months. I met a ton of people who survived, uh, Aura, Combine, Virginia Tech, and I'm putting this group together who are really, really passionate about solving the violence problem, and we're going to go after big pharma, we're going to go after mental illnesses, we're going to go after gun regulations that are allowing people to sell arms, to, you know, inner city arms dealers. There's a ton of things that we're going to go after in the documentary that hopefully by the end of it, you know, create a culture of peace in the country. And I guess the best way I can connect that to Sirius and the followers of Sirius are extraterrestrial civilizations, I believe, at this point in time, have learned how to become a peaceful and very organized culture. 
And I think we as a society will never join that club. We don't realize that peace is the best economic vehicle. It's the best intellectual vehicle. Because if we create peace and we create prosperity for a number of people in our society who are at this point, like, you know, shunned and put into like amazing, horrible situations of violence at a young age, we might actually be able to farm better relationships with extraterrestrials who are at that like civilized manner. So for me, doing serious uh, brought on the idea that, hey, we, we have a ton of problems at home that we're not willing to take care of. And one of them is this violence problem that Americans are just, I don't know, we're just uh, we're one of the most violent countries in the world. And why is it? Like, why are we just all of a sudden thinking that's the normal way? Why does capitalism tell us, oh, it's it's what that makes good economics? That doesn't make sense. I grew up in a hood. Like, there's no business trying to invest in where I was raised. So mm-hmm. it doesn't make better sense. If there was peace, more people would economically invest in inner cities around the downtown area. And that would raise property values and get more economics. And so nurse Ukraine is going to tackle that the best. I mean, at the, at the best level that we can handle it. And I'll, I'll plug the website real quick. But I'm just nurseukraine.org. Go there, check it out, see what we're talking about, join the movement. It, it's very much in line with the serious movement. It's definitely, I know there's a ton of like gun owners out there who are worried about the guns right now. I'm a gun owner. The discussion that we're having is more to do with legitimate small changes that we can do to make our society more peaceful. And it, it isn't so much about, and Tim, I think you and I had a Facebook discussion one time back and forth and just like, you know, a lot of people are scared about a tyrannical government. But our idea is if you are a law-abiding citizen and you're able to follow these four or five simple steps to owning and registering a gun, you can have any firearm you want. So I think Russian Crimes is going to be a dynamic and powerful film. And um, hopefully we'll have announcements on that over the upcoming year. Excellent. So check that out, people. Nurserycrimes.org. You know, I'm looking forward to see kind of how you put the solutions on the table after kind of showing us what the problems are from your point of view. Because it is about solutions and it's about finding a way to get people to choose peace. It's something we're going to have to choose. And I think you're completely right. They're obviously here. And when I say they, I mean extraterrestrials. They're obviously here. They've obviously been here and they're obviously not being completely open about contact for a reason. It makes sense that there are peaceful civilizations who are waiting for us to figure that out. And it's going to be a challenge because we know that our culture is being prompted towards violence for a number of reasons by people who want to keep things going the way they are. And I think that Sirius, I, I hope in my the bottom of my soul that Sirius is able to blow the doors open, not just on UFO disclosure, but on free energy disclosure because that is a linchpin once that comes out once people know one extraterrestrials are real and two we don't need to pay these power companies and and we could definitely have abundant energy you know at will and be able to provide for the least of the people on this planet and that's just the crash just crack in the surface anti-grav and water desalinization and it just opens up pandora's box of great stuff for planet earth that allows us to choose peace i think the biggest difficulty we had um and i'm going to try to say this in the most diplomatic way in the most honest way that i can because i believe the transparency is the best situation the difficulty we had with sirius was dealing with the human ego what i mean by that is a number of people who are buying into capitalism in all of its glory, in the way that it's fed them, or the way that it's always been for them, they were the ones that were standing in the way of us getting to true interviews of people who are doing groundbreaking things, like, for example, uh, John Searle people here in, in Los Angeles. Like, we tried and attempted to go after and get the best evidence, get into the best laboratories possible. But you got to understand him, and especially the people listening, you got to understand that all of these people are coming to a table and then elbowing each other off the table constantly. And they're doing it in such a way that they have a research lab and, and a bunch of, you know, new energy stuff. So why, why would it be that guy? And then they'll, like, stay in your way and find a way to, like, dismantle what you're doing. And that's what I meant about the politics of filmmaking. It's, it's not so easy. I've probably received over maybe 200 emails from, you know, new scientists that are attempting to do something or can show over unity results. I mean, it's hard to deal with politics of filmmaking. And I'm, that, that's me saying it the most diplomatic possible way I can say it. 
we're dealing with human ego, and that itself is continuously standing in the way of progress. It has a lot to do with the basic idea that there's an, there's an X amount of resources and X number of dollars that can go around, and I won't get the most of them. And that that's the problem, because I really, if we can debunk that thinking, a number of other things can happen. That's what I was dealing with even on this project as a director. I'm dealing with a ton of, of ego. Well, Arm, thank you so much for your contribution to the future of this entire planet, because I got to believe that this project, Nursery Crimes, and whatever you do next, they're going to make your kids' lives better. They're going to make my kids' lives better, and that's going to be better for everybody. And so your work is very appreciated. Please keep up what you're doing, and we hope to catch up with you down the line when this is all out, and at some point, maybe have more of a spiritual conversation with you concerning uh, your own spirituality. Absolutely. Well, one last thing, if we could. Let's talk about Sundance. Absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, Tim, like you just have like the ten most nicest things to me in the world. Like I believe that you're you're just way too nice. I hope we can make a dent in some things, you know. But in terms of dance, uh, we premiered the trailer, which you guys got to see it for other people who are on the inside. You got to see it beforehand. But we premiered it for the public for Sunday this year, and we, we took the serious trailer and we took it out. Uh, James Jane was there, who um, he played uh, the lead role on HBO, and he, he played the Punisher, if you guys remember that movie. And Steve was there, we sent Steve there. I wasn't able to go because I was working in an orphanage in Mexico. It was amazingly well connected. People got the feel of it. They understood that there's something that is a gravity toss in the film, and it's moving people to like think about the product. Now, I always have to remind inside people, like, people have been doing work on this for a long time. You might watch the trailer and think to yourself, well, you know, it's A, B, or B. But you got to remember the avatar that we're going after in order to crack this open in the mainstream is completely different than the people who are on the inside. You guys are people who got to the information first. But we're trying to get to the people who are a little bit more hesitant to consider those, you know, options. So we have to do it in a more clever way that appeals to them. And that's the conundrum. That's going to be the push and pull. And I can predict it from now to the future that there's going to be always internal paucity of people who knew about this stuff before and who are, are going to look at Sirius a certain way. But I hope that they understand that our goal is to obviously appeal to the mainstream audience and get them more enveloped into the knowledge, the information, you know? Hey, whatever you have to do to give this thing legs, the further that we can get this, the better. We really need everybody to know. People talk about, oh, well, UFO disclosure, you know, Medvedev in Russia is talking about it, and they're talking about it in South America. We need everybody on board. We need everybody to be talking about this and, and openly accept extraterrestrial reality. And until that happens, the powers that be are still going to have the truth under their thumb. We need to pull it out. And so if you need to, you know, couch a trailer in a certain way or even the film itself so that it is accessible to more people, then by all means, brother, do it. We're behind you. Thank you. Um, and keep promoting it. Social media aspect of this is one thing that makes us as a documentary film completely different and unique than everybody, including Inconvenient Truth, which was funded by a bunch of people who already were like propagandizing the situation. And we don't want to, we went after the truth and you guys supported us and we went after it hard as we could. And I think ultimately I'm proud of the film. I think everybody in our production company, I know Steve is head over heels about the film. Um, you know, ultimately let's let's get as many people knowing the information and I always have to I always have to leave people with the the idea of, I mean the, the nugget of thought that I have after, you know, a year worth of meditation on this cuz that's all that filmmaking is is specifically I don't even know if the powers that be know if these things exist. I mean, the the political structure the way it is, people blame government, but government uh, just like a big puppet show they come in and out and they only know very terrestrial things. They know very black and white hard facts that they can see in front of them. They're more scientific now than they ever have been. They lack the spiritual like creativity and understanding that there might be different realms of uh, possibilities that we could tap into if we like practice or study that. And then point two is if there are if there are conspirators that are holding this information and knowledge back. It would be because they themselves would be scared of promoting something that would make them uh, be ridiculed. The more power you do have when somebody gives you information like that, just imagine, let's say, Tim, you're, and I know you're, you know, you're doing well, let's say you're a multi-multi-billionaire, you know, and you've been inducted into this 
uh, Fraternal Order of Secret Society of the top 20 people that you know, and you guys all brainstorm and think tank together. And one of those guys says, I'm going to give you guys some crazy information. And he brings that ET in the room and shows you guys there's extraterrestrials out there, right? I mean, what would you do walking away from that? You're like a multi-billionaire. You walk away from that and you don't say to yourself, I'm going to promote this. I'm going to send this to everybody. You would think to yourself, oh, my God, I don't know what to do. I'm perplexed. So I'm just going to follow the lead of what this guy told me to do. And this guy probably said to you, hey, I'm going to give you some information and some secrets, but I want you guys to never let this leave the room. You And you would just trust him. You would just be like, okay, he gave me that. He told me the, the craziest secret in the world, and I can't tell anybody. I'm going to probably just die with this one because I don't know what it's going to do to my all this money if I, I've accumulated. Uh, are people going to turn on me? Are people going to think that I'm some kind of Satan because I deal with, you know, an ET being rather than these angelic Christ beings, you know, like, what do you, what do you do if you're in that situation? It's a, it's, it's a conundrum. I suppose. I still think at the end of the day, um, the idealist in me might win out. Just because, and I, I think you share this, one, you obviously believe in transparency and, and giving the truth to anyone who would hear it, but just the idea of, of being separated from everybody doesn't jive with my worldview, and I think that in a reality where everything is just part of one thing, and then you're only hurting yourself in the long run by trying to keep something from someone else. No, absolutely. You you make a good point. Now, what if I said you got the same scenario, but he doesn't bring an ET in the room and he just says it to you? He says that this is possible or this is potential. And he does this whole nebulous thing where he says, okay, now I want you to sit and meditate and it all tap in. You know, and he, he, my point is the less firm it becomes, the less um, willing you are to, to risk your prestige on it. Does that make yeah. sense? Well, yeah. I mean, if you're of the mindset that releasing this is, you know, going to put your wonderful life in jeopardy, then yeah. I mean, it's definitely a strong incentive to keep your trap shut. I, I get you. Yeah, that's the problem. That's why I mean, ideally, maybe the one thing that we all have as a society have to accept is being angry with those who had already kept the secret for so long. If, if, if you know, given that they have, the more anger we show to them, the less they'd be willing to let the secret out of the bag because it would really like the ridicule would kill them their livelihood, their speed, or anything else. If we were a culture of forgiveness and peace and understanding, I think we would be dealing with a, a much uh, different situation right now, given the last 200 years. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, forgiveness could definitely be part of it. Because if you are of the mindset that, you know, reality is really just everything is all one part of one thing, then even those guys are really just an other part of you. And it behooves you to forgive them. And let's all move on together. Let's give each other peace. Let's give each other abundance. Let's give each other truth and move into being a planetary civilization that is in contact with other planetary civilizations and join a galactic community and live and share with, with those who have gone before us. Absolutely. I'm getting better, better myself. <laughs> oh, I bet you could. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Arm. Have a good evening. We'll talk to you down the road. Peace, brother. Peace. Thanks for listening to my interview with Amardeep Kaleka. I hope it's filled your heart with a little hope and maybe inspired you to be the change you wish to see in this world. This is just the beginning, guys, as I continue to bring you discussions that hopefully push humanity further toward a future that works for everyone. Please know that I'll also be working to bring them to you with the audio quality you and my guests deserve. We'll have it worked out long before Arm Kaleka returns to this show. To keep up on future podcasts, subscribe to email updates through the website at bravonewworld.blogspot.com. You'll find the email subscription panel at the upper right of the page. Plus, get news and discussions that really matter in your Facebook feed by liking the Bravo New World Facebook page at facebook.com slash bravonewworldblogcast. You can also follow me on Twitter at Tim Bravo. Until next time, kids, keep your eye to the sky and your ear to the ground. We are all one, so namaste and peace to us all.
my fascination with it started. And then it kind of branched off, and as we started to see the disclosure tapes, we started to think about, is there information that secret societies have that they're holding back on by using it for their own personal gains? What's going on? So I think, personally, the extraterrestrial questions and thoughts and uh, the ideas, uh, they've matured now more than ever to be as close to reality as I could get them in terms of like having a year worth of research and talking to an amazing amount of people in interviews and, and getting down to the crux of it. Awesome. Now, I got to ask you, though, have you ever had a UFO sighting of your own? Interestingly enough, I've never had a UFO sighting before uh, Sirius. Have you since? I have. I have. As a matter of fact, it was on a, a C5 exhibition. Ah. And I want to reiterate, it was amazing. I mean, it's in the film. It's one of the first things you see in the film. Uh, we were in Colorado, Crestone, and it happened to me multiple times over that session. Something would talk to me, and I was meditating, and I'd look up over my right shoulder where the whisper was coming, and I'd look up, and there was this thing floating to the sky. And it, it, it would be floating very slow in terms of like the way it is uh, moving and progressing through the sky. Good day, sisters and brothers of planet Earth. I'm Tim Bravo. Thanks for opening your hearts and minds today. I first learned of Amardeep Kaleka and his production company Neverending Light when the first trailer for the upcoming film Sirius hit the internet. Like many of you, I've followed Dr. Stephen Greer's work with the Disclosure Project for years. The trailer, and everyone released since then, provides a very encouraging look at a film that could blow the doors open on UFO disclosure once and for all. I immediately followed Kaleka on Vimeo and signed up for serious updates. There was a lot of buzz about the movie due to its tremendous Kickstarter campaign. Amardeep Kaleka was a filmmaker poised to make crowdfunding history. Then, August 5th, 2012 came. News spread like wildfire that another mass shooting event had gone down in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. We were told a white supremacist PSYOPs Army veteran shot and killed six members of a Sikh congregation. And that's when the world outside the UFO disclosure community met Amardeep Kaleka. Because one of the victims, the founder of the temple, just happened to be Amardeep's dear father, Satwan Singh Kaleka. In a way, Amardeep became the face of this tragedy, granting interview after interview across major media. Now, with work on Sirius nearing completion, Neverending Light has announced its next project, a film called Nursery Crimes, a documentary about violence in America and how we can come together to stop it. I've asked Amardeep to be my first guest and kick off these Bravo New World podcasts right. In the following interview, I hope you'll be able to listen past some internet audio issues to hear what Arm has to say. We're going to get an update on Sirius, hear some of the out-of-this-world experiences that have come his way as director of the film, and how the film's most recent trailer was received at the Sundance Film Festival. We'll get his take on what happened the day his father's temple was attacked. Take a look at Nursery Crimes, and hopefully learn a bit about the person, the soul, that is our brother, Amardeep Kaleka. Amardeep, thanks a million for coming on and sharing with us. Absolutely. Now, how has your understanding of the UFO topic changed since working with Dr. Greer on this film? I mean, we've gotten, came into the subject from the Ancient Aliens franchise, because we obviously uh, started following them. It's funny because randomly I go to the Apple store here in LA and somebody will me from Sirius now and they'll ask me the same question. I say, what do you think about engineering theory? And it, it is uh, an interesting aspect. Um, that for my, it would seem unnatural, like it was going to fall out of space, you know? And I mean, it definitely, I was riveted by it. There was an emotional connection with, you know, the UFO. So you actually had a telepathic communication, not just a sighting. That's pretty awesome. That was pretty awesome, and um, it was definitely uh, me and the other camp person were sitting across from each other, and we had some sort of like voice talking to us. And you know the difference between you talking to yourself and something external. Yeah. Because it's like it's almost like a call and response. You ask a question, it answers, and it asks you a question, and you answer. Him. And when you're answering, the next part of the you know the answer from that side is coming. So it's a true back and forth. And what people in the in the field call going to channel one. So you know maybe beings from all over the universe can be in that specific channel at the same time as the chat room. <laughs>
Interesting. And that's almost, to me, more just, just more astounding uh, an experience than having a sighting. I mean, that is, that's contact. Well, that's, that's what we're trying to get across to the film. Because it's, it's not so much we have to search for physical truth and the evidence behind it. And we want to reiterate that most of the evidence that we can find points to the fact that people need to continue searching and need to figure out what's going on because it's obviously... There's a group of people on this planet who have hidden the truth from you for a very long time. They have a vision for your future that they know doesn't work unless they keep you in the dark about some things. Like the true nature of our spirituality, the truth about how our reality works, how each of us has the ability to choose and change it, individually, but especially when united. The truth about civilizations that rose and fell before our own. The truth that we are not alone on this planet and have never been. I'm Tim Bravo. Over years of searching, studying, synchronicities, and experience, I've discovered that the big picture of our reality is very different from the one that's been spoon-fed and programmed into us through school, religion, and mainstream media. We've been lulled into a hypnotic sleep, a nightmare really, conned into co-creating a world that doesn't come close to reflecting our true nature. I'm here to help others wake up so we can work together as sisters and brothers to create a new vision for our future and a world that works for all of us. This is Bravo New World.